Thank you, Pastor Rod. Good morning, friends. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we want to welcome those who are tuning in and joining us online to the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, uh, you know, we're praising God that the, the building is 99% complete and we have uh, the rain is being kept out. It's been finally got some rain in California after a year of fires. And so we're very thankful for that. And we're, we're glad that we can come together and this technology is available to study the Word of God with you. Today's scripture that you heard is dealing with that uh, prophecy that was given originally in Isaiah and repeated by Matthew. They'll call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. It's interesting that the gospel writer said that it's being interpreted or it's translated God with us. In other words, he knew that the people who would someday be reading that may not be Jews and understand it in Hebrew, that the message of Jesus coming was not just for Jews, and so he translates, this is what it means, God with us. It's interesting, you don't find the word Emmanuel anywhere else in the New Testament, but the teaching of God with us is a biblical teaching. It's really the teaching of what we would call the incarnation and uh, that is just a phenomenal mystery. And I should probably preface anything I say this morning by uh, just stating that when we talk about God entering into humanity and one member of the, the Godhead somehow coming into the flesh of a human, that is a mystery. And the Bible speaks of the mystery of iniquity and you get the mystery of godliness. Mystery of iniquity is the devil wanting to be God the creation wanting to be God, and the mystery of godliness is God entering into the creation and becoming a human. And for me, I just, I can't imagine what that must have been like when there in heaven, before Jesus was to enter into Mary, uh, or the essence of that divinity, it says that the Holy Spirit this brought about this conception that uh, God the Father and the Son embraced and, and he said, I'll see you in 33 and a half years. Actually, including gestation, it would have been uh, longer than that, a little more than 34. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had surgery with general anesthetic where they knock you out. I've only had that a couple of times. Uh, once then they took my tonsils out, another time I won't tell you about. But uh, they, basically they put this mask over your face and uh, they say you just start caning backwards and you, you, they're putting you asleep and you're wondering will I wake up again and at some point Jesus said to the father you lay down on a golden street in heaven I don't know what happened it's a mystery but he basically laid aside his divinity and suddenly became extremely vulnerable as a human and entered into humanity but you know, the most beautiful part of this passage is that God would be willing to be with us. And this teaching is a teaching you find all through the Bible. And I remember hearing a story of, um, oh, one night there was a thunderstorm and little Billy got uh, nervous and so he opened up his bedroom door and he called downstairs. He said, Dad, can you come upstairs and stay in bed with me? Dad said, you're okay, Billy. Jesus is with you. And he said, but yeah, right now, I really need someone with skin on. <laughs> and uh, that's what Jesus did. He came into our world, and he put on our skin. He became one of us to reach us. You know, there are three really principal things we're going to look at. There's three words here that we're going to consider. And we've got a lot to say about these three words. God, with us. That's what our focus is going to be, and I will not even touch the tip of the iceberg of the truth that's contained in those incredible words. Uh, this is probably one of the most amazing and hopeful passages in the Bible. So we're going to be talking about who, God, where, with, it's talking about uh, that he is, a, the word with means to be accompanied by another person or thing. It gives you a locality. With whom? us. Now the reason this verse is so important is because there is a great 
gulf between humanity and God. You know, God is everywhere, but we can't see him. There's nowhere you can really flee from his presence. But the, the blessing of God is separated from many people. The communion of God is separated from many people. Even Jonah couldn't run from God. So God is everywhere. He fills heaven and earth. And when Solomon dedicated the temple, he said, the heavens of heavens is not big enough to contain you. So we're going to talk about those three points. God being with and with us. First of all, who is it that is with us? It says God. But it's talking about Jesus. Now, you've probably heard there's an ongoing debate. It's been going on for about 1,900 years. Is Jesus God? Well, right here in this verse, when it says you'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us, I would think that would settle the issue. It's telling us that Jesus is God the Son. He became with us. But that won't be enough for some. So let me give you a few thoughts and passages to explain how profound it is the one who is going to be with us is the Almighty Creator. Is Jesus God? John 5, 17. Now, I'm giving out a lot of verses today. I don't know if the kids want to count how many verses I'm giving out, but it may be a record. Uh, you may want to take uh, notes if you want to remember some of these passages. John 5, 17 and 18. Jesus answered and said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, not only because he broke the Sabbath, but that he said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now Jesus never denied his equality with God. When Moses said, Whom shall I say? He's speaking to God at the burning bush. He clearly says he's talking to God at the burning bush. Who shall I say has sent me? How did God respond? I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am. Those words indicate the self-existent one. Um, God did not come from anybody or anything. He has lived from everlasting to everlasting. So look at all the times now that Jesus used that same phrase to define himself. You can read in John 8, 58, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. You see, Jesus knew what he was saying. They knew Jesus knew what he was saying. They knew that unless he was God, that's blasphemy. Because Jesus was taking the title of Jehovah. He says, I am. They took up stones to throw at him. And Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Read in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. John is the big I am book. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, 9, I am the door. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 36, I am the son of God. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. John 10, verse 33, I and my father are one. So he continues to refer to himself as I am, I am, I am, I am. And the Jews took up stones to stone him again. Jesus said, many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of those do you stone me? They said, not for a good work, but because of blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. You know, it's interesting. Jesus never came out and said, I am God. But he said it every other way he could say it. He made it very clear. For instance, the Bible tells us only God can forgive sin. Isaiah 43, 25, even I am the one who blots out your transgressions. Mark 2, 5 through 7, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of those scribes that were sitting there said, why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? They were right, only God can forgive sin. According to the Bible, let's face it now, could Jesus forgive sin? What did the angel say to Mary? You'll call his name Jesus because he'll do what? He'll save his people from their sins. Another definition for God. Only God can read hearts. 1 Kings 8, 39. Whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. God and God only knows the thoughts of your hearts. It's good to know the devil cannot read your mind when you pray. Um, nothing wrong with praying out loud, but the devil can't read your mind. Only God can read your mind. 
Psalm 44, 21. Would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. But you read about Jesus. Matthew 9, 4. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? He knew. John 2, 25. For he knew what was in man. I could cite you a dozen different examples in the ministry of Christ where he knew what they were thinking. At the feast in Simon's house, Simon is thinking if this man is a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him for he's, she is a sinner. And Jesus turns to Simon and answers his thoughts. He knew he could read his mind. Only God can do that. Jesus is God. The Bible says, who knows the first five words in the Bible? In the beginning, God created. Okay, maybe it's not first five. God created. Who created the world? God. Well, you read in Colossians 1.16, For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven above and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. You read in John 1 verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. Hebrews tells us, through Christ, God made the worlds. But the Bible says in the beginning, God created. That's not a problem if Jesus is God. So when Jesus came into the world, what you've got is God with us. The Bible tells us, one of the commandments, thou shalt not have other gods. And even Jesus said, thou shalt worship the Lord alone. We are to worship nobody but God. Is that right? And that's in uh, Matthew 4.10. It is written, you shall worship the Lord God. Him only shall you serve. But did Jesus receive worship? Hebrews 1.6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. Matthew 2.11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child, this is the wise men, with his mother Mary, they fell down and they worshiped him. Joseph of Mary did not say, no, no, don't do that. It was appropriate because this was God incarnate. You can read in Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus rose from the dead and he went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them and said, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. But you're only supposed to worship God. John 20, he rises from the dead, verse 28. He appears to Thomas. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He worshiped him. And uh, you've got a number of other examples where Jesus accepts worship. Even angels told you when John fell down to worship an angel in Revelation, then the angel said, don't do that. The only one to be worshipped is God. And so it's not a problem to worship Jesus because he is God. God is our judge, the Bible tells us. 1 Samuel 2.10, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Psalms 98, verse 8 and 9. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He will judge the world and the peoples with equity. What does the New Testament tell us about who is our judge? For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. So how should we honor the Son? Just as we honor the Father. The Father and the, so Jesus said, I'm in the Father, he's in me, we are one. Now they have different functions, but Jesus is God the Son. So, you know, the Bible's pretty clear. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you look at the different definitions in the Bible for God, and you're going to find Jesus fits all of those definitions. And so uh, when we read God with us, um, Jesus did not begin his existence there in uh, Bethlehem. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. It tells us that out of Bethlehem would come the one who is coming from everlasting. He was incarnate then. But even before Jesus came into the world, he appeared several times in the Old Testament when this captain of the Lord's army appears to Joshua. And uh, he said, are you for our adversaries or are you for us? And he says, neither, but I've come as captain of the Lord's army. Take your shoes off your feet for you're on holy ground. And Joshua fell down and worshiped him. Who do you think that was? Who was it that talked to Abraham when the, he came with the two angels? Abraham addressed him as Jehovah. He's the Lord. 
And so this is God, Jesus, pre-incarnate. There are times in history when he came and appeared to man. So as we're talking about the one who is with us, when you think of Jesus, Jesus is not a lesser God. This is the God who created all things, who sustains all things, and he is saying, I want to be with you. Now that right there, if we park and go home, that is a phenomenal thought. You know, I was doing a, um, I was doing a letter and I was looking for a verse in the Bible, I thought it must be there somewhere, about how wonderful it will be to be with our friends in heaven. And I went through all the verses I could find that talks about who we will be with in heaven, and I was surprised there was almost nothing that talked about our being with our friends or our family in heaven. All of the Bible writers talk about how wonderful it will be to be with God in heaven. There is that verse in 1 Thessalonians where it says we will be caught up together with them and so we'll ever be with the Lord. So there's no question we'll be together. But the emphasis of the Bible writers is not that you and I get to be together in heaven. The emphasis of the Bible writers is we get to be with God in heaven. You know, and that should really be the greatest desire when you think about that. The angels, the highest honor is those who are by the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy. They're being throbbing with joy and bliss uh, and just to be in his presence. So we talked a little bit about God. Now let's talk a little bit about God being with us. You know, especially in the world right now with the, um, at the time of this recording, the pandemic is still lingering, and there we're going through a second wave, and so many people are isolated. And you know what's especially sad? As I hear stories of people who have been married for 60 years, they've been together all of that time, and then because one gets sick, they're in the hospital, they're isolated, they cannot even go see their spouse. And you probably heard some of these touching stories of people who are separated from the ones they love. And I've seen some just very moving news reports of people who are separated for weeks while one is getting treatment and how they finally are together in the reunions. And I saw this one report where these uh, two senior citizens, husband and wife, been married for like 75 years. One was separated, they didn't know if he'd make it and all she could think about was being back with her husband again and they were forced for several weeks as he went through a difficult recovery and it finally shows them being wheeled together again and they're, they're crying so they can finally be reunited and they're hugging each other and, and uh, I thought they looked kind of old and wrinkled but they thought each other looked beautiful. It was something to see. So we're living in that age where people are alone and the Bible says, woe to him who is alone when he falls. And the Bible tells us it's not good for man to be alone. That's not just meaning men, but mankind. God created us social creatures. But not only did God make man and woman for each other, God made man and God for each other. Why would God make us in his image and not want communion with us? God wants to be with us. I mean, you think about it. One of the greatest honors for humanity is that the Almighty would condescend to become a human. You realize that Jesus married himself with the human race for eternity? God became a man, not just for the time that he redeems us, but even after the resurrection, he still bore the human form. And he will still have the scars in his hands through eternity. You know, that really ought to give you an exalted idea of our value and our worth that God would say, I will align myself forever with the human race. And some people think that, uh, you know, we're just highly evolved monkeys. No. Humans are made in the image of God. And God wants to be with us. But we've been separated. Now, the book of Matthew is interesting. It starts by saying God with us, and it ends by saying God with us. Did you know that? Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always. And of course, at the beginning, his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. A theme of Matthew is that God wants to be reunited with us. Why is this important? Because we have been separated from God by a terrible pandemic called sin. Isaiah chapter 59, but your iniquities, this is verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. 
We've been separated from God. Now, angels are in this room. God sees what's happening here. God promises when you gather in his name, which we have done, he is with us. Now, not only for the people that might be here, but the vast majority who are watching online, we gather in his name, he's with us. And he honors us with his presence. But because of sin, sin separates. After Adam and Eve sinned, God came walking in the cool of the garden looking for them. They ran from him because they were ashamed. The shame of sin separates. I, I know some people, they don't go to church. They think they're not good enough. And they, the shame is keeping them away. And that's too bad because it's so backwards to think that when I'm good enough, I'll come to church. It's kind of like a mother telling her dirty children, will you get cleaned up so you can take a bath? You don't get cleaned up so you can take a bath. You take a bath so you can get cleaned up. So for people to think I'm not good enough to come to God, Adam and Eve ran from God because of their shame. People stay away from God. They don't open the Bible because it makes them feel guilty. God wants to be with us. And the Bible promises if we draw near to him, he'll run to meet us like the father with the prodigal son. He will draw near to meet us. He doesn't want to be separated from us. So our sins have separated us. Ephesians 2.13. And at the time you were without Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world. What a sad position to be in. People all around the world, without Christ, without God, separated from God. Micah chapter 3, verse 4. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. Our sins have separated us from God. So what's the solution? God wants to be back together with us. He must separate us from our sins. God is not staying away in our sinful condition because he doesn't love us. He is staying away because he does love us. Because the presence of God, the holy presence of God is a consuming fire. If we were to all say, Lord, in your undiminished glory, will you please come into this place right now? We couldn't bear it. Even the holy priests of God, even Moses, when God's Shekinah glory filled the temple, they left. It says they could not bear it. God says, yes, I want nothing more than to be with you, but if I was to be with you now in my unveiled glory, it would consume you. You could not bear it. The holiness would just vaporize you. So I'm veiling my glory in a human form. Again, that's a mystery how that happened. I'm going to come into your world to show you who I am. I'm going to come into the world and teach you how to live and how to treat each other. And then I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to deal with the disease so we can be reunited without the veil in between. This is the purpose for the plan of salvation, that we might be back together with God. It's called reconciliation. This is what redemption is like. Whenever you sin, sin separates. Sin separates you from God. Sin separates you from others. Sin separates you from you. You know, there's three involved in the great commandment. Love the Lord, all your heart, your neighbor, yourself. Sin hurts the relationship with God, hurts the relationship with your neighbor, and sin hurts your relationship with you. When people are crushed under guilt and shame, they never feel very happy about life and themselves. When you're forgiven and born again, that's when you have the joy of the Lord. So Jesus, he's not separated from our sins because he doesn't love us. He's separated from our sins because he does love us. He doesn't want to destroy us. So he needs to deal with the sin problem. And that's why he came. Sin separates. Obedience draws our presence to God. 1 Kings 8, 57, 58. This is Solomon in his dedication prayer of the temple. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May, notice with us. May he not leave us or forsake us that, he, that we may incline our hearts to himself. I'm sorry, that he may incline our hearts to himself. For what purpose? To walk in his ways and to keep his commandments. We need God with us to help us walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Philemon 4, 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So as we do 
all we can humanly to draw near to God, to submit, to obey God. He draws near to us and we invite his presence. Something else that happens is if we focus on the outside, um, we can be distracted. God wants us to focus on the inside. God being with us, not with us on the outside, but with us on the inside. Genesis 28, when Jacob had that dream and the Lord appeared in a ladder, he said, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to the land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And Jacob awoke from the place. He said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he sets up a pillar and he anoints it. He thought that God was in that spot geographically, and God was saying, No, Jacob, when I said I'm going to be with you, I want to be in you wherever you go during that next 21 years while he was wandering. John 14, 20, Jesus said, And in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So Jesus is in the Father, and Jesus said he's in us. Now, by the way, don't think for a moment that God the Father is up there, he's in the sky, and he really wants to snuff us out because he's the judge, and we sinned, and he needs to execute uh, you know, his wrath against sinners. And Jesus then, he jumps between us and the wrath of God, and he pleads that God will forgive us. Jesus is the nice, merciful one, the Father is the wrathful one. I, I meet people all the time. I even hear preachers talk like, you know, God is up there wanting to burn us up and Jesus is trying to stop him. And they forget that God the Father loves you. This is what Jesus said. God the Father so loved the world, he sent his son. Jesus does not love you more than the Father and the Father does not love you more than Jesus. They both love you equally and fully because they are love. Amen? Amen. John 14, 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for catch this, he dwells with you and will be in you. This is what Paul said all through his writing, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ wants to be in us. What could be better to have Jesus standing by you or living in you? This is what he wants. He wants to be in us. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? So when you talk about with, how does he want to be with us? Not just like he's with the nation, not kind of like, you know, the children of Israel going through the wilderness and they had the pillar of fire and they said, yeah, there he is, God's with us. We sometimes think about the pillar on the outside, God wants the fire on the inside. This is how, it's an upgrade. This is how Jesus wants to be with us. Now, we can cope with almost anything if we know that God is with us. Do you know that? If you really know that the Lord is with you and there's no trouble that is coming into your life, there's no trial that is coming to you except that he's measuring it out and, and he is there with you. One reason that Alexander the Great was able to conquer the world is he always went into battle with his troops and he was right there on the front line. He did not like uh, generals today sit in a room somewhere in another country and order them where to go. Uh, he went out there with his sword in hand and his men were willing to die for him. You know, I remember reading a story in the Bible. You know, the 30 mighty men of David. And I could never forget the story of Eliezer. The, remember, the reason I remember the story of Eliezer is because he was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. Now, you see, I just smile, because in our culture, dodo is a dumb bird that, you know, is extinct now because it was so dumb. But dodo actually means beloved. It's a good Hebrew word. And, uh, but Eliezer was in a battle with David. And it says that this was one occasion when the men of Israel retreated from the Philistines. But David would not retreat. And Eliezer said, well, if David's not retreating, I'm not retreating. And David and Eliezer stood back to back, and they fought against the Philistines, and it says that they, they defended this hill of barley, and they had a great slaughter. At the end of the battle, they'd fought so long and so hard, Eliezer could not even let go of his sword. His hand claved to his sword, but uh, he became one of David's mighty men. He said, I will not leave David. Now, I could understand that because you realize David never lost a battle. And so if you've got David with you, do you ever have to be afraid of the enemy? Can you name one battle that David lost? He fought a lot of battles. 
He won every battle. You can't even point to where David was wounded. So uh, it's like, you know, he was good luck. If you were with David, that's good. You know that it seemed like he had the angelic protection about him. And whatever you're going through, if you know that Jesus is with you, should you be afraid? Barak said to Deborah, and this is Judges 4.8, if you will go with me, then I will go. He went into the battle, but he said, if you will not go with me, I will not go. And that's something we can say to the Lord. Judges 6.12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. The most, most important thing that God could say to Gideon to encourage him is what? Even though it looks like the Midianites have totally decimated the land, the Lord is with you. You have nothing to be afraid of if God is with you. Deuteronomy 4, 7, Moses said, For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason he may call upon him. You know, I've just got to tell you, honestly, friends, we had an amazing fact board meeting this week, and when it came time to do my little segment of the president's report for our board members, and our board is online, we're scattered around the country, I said, first thing I've got to tell you is this is a miracle. I said, this whole, the whole Amazing Facts is a miracle. You think about it, and for a ministry to live, this is our 55th year, 55 years, never knowing from week to week if the money was going to come in. We have no guaranteed income from any organization, denomination, corporation. It's by faith. 55 years, the bills have always been paid. It is a miracle that we are right now in this facility that I won't tell you how much, but it was expensive. You could retire somewhere really nice for what it costs to build this. And here we are. We told the bank this week, thank you very much for offering to lend us money. Doesn't look like we're going to need it. To have a bill. Now, we haven't had our big dedication yet, but that is a miracle. It is a miracle. And the only thing I can say is, God is with us. Amen. That's the best thing. That uh, it, it's clear that God has been blessing, I think, because we've been trusting in him. In the presence of God, if God is with us, don't be discouraged if you notice the dirt. The Bible tells us Jesus is a light, and the light came into the world. And when you're next to the light, you will be aware of the darkness. Isaiah 6, 5, here's Isaiah the prophet. We're going to study this in a couple of weeks. He sees the Lord in his glory on his throne. And what does he say? Woe is me, I am undone. And the translation for that in, uh, in Hebrew would be uy is me. You ever heard a Jew say uy ve? It means woe is me. He said, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Here he is in the blazing light of God's glory and he sees the sin. Jesus performs a miracle for Peter, fills their nets. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and he says, Lord, depart from me. This is Luke 5, verse 8. He says, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. You see all these cases in the Bible where God reveals his power and his glory and those near God, they suddenly become aware of their sin. So if God is with you, you may feel conviction, but don't send him away. Conviction is healthy. He came to save us from our sins. See what I'm saying? So when we're, when we're in the presence of God, we may notice every spot of defilement standing in the blazing glory of his holiness. Something about, else about being with God, um, you don't want to presume God is with you if he's not. You want to know he's really with you. There are some examples in the Bible of people who had, they're living in disobedience and they just assume God was with us in the past, he's probably still with me. You know the story of Samson. God had given him great power, filled him with the Holy Spirit, but he continued to uh, live a life of high-handed disobedience. And it says, uh, Delilah said, the Philistines are upon you, Judges 16, 20. Samson awoke from his sleep, and he'd gone out at his other times to shake himself free, but he didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. Those are some of the saddest words in the Bible. I wonder how many people out there are saying, Lord, Lord, and they don't know. Jesus says, depart from me, you who work iniquity. So we want to know that God is really with us. Amen? 
children of Israel disobeyed the Lord. They didn't have faith he could bring them into the promised land. And God said, look, if you don't think, for every, for every day that the spies wandered, searching the promised land, you're going to spend a year. And they said, oh, no, we, we were just kidding. We don't want to wander 40 years. We'll go up right now. And they decided without Moses, without God's approval, they said, we're just going to go fight. We're going to take the land right now. We don't want to wander. Moses said, don't go. God isn't with you. And they didn't listen. Do not go up lest you are defeated by your enemies. The Lord is not among you. This is not God's will. When we are going away from God's will, you are going away from God's presence. When they're talking about God being with you, if you are deliberately going away from God's will, you're walking away from God's presence. I uh, love that quote from Betsy Tin Boom. This is Corey Tin Boom's sister. It's in the book, The Hiding Place. When they're in a German, it was a Nazi concentration camp, and uh, Betsy seemed to have peace no matter what was happening. She was fully surrendered to the Lord. I'm sorry, um, yeah, Betsy. And she told her sister, Corey, she said, the safest place in the world is to be in the center of God's will. And she said, even here, God is with us. We don't have to be, if you know that you are surrendered to God's will, he is going to be with you. You have nothing to be afraid of. It doesn't matter what's happening to you financially, circumstantially, health-wise, that if you are surrendered to God's will, God is with you. But don't make the mistake, the sons of Eli, they said, yeah, we're in the church business. They took the ark of God and they went to fight the Philistines and God said, you might have the ark, but I'm not with you. And they were defeated in battle because they had been living in defiance. So, when going through these different points of uh, understanding the presence of God, God is with those who think and talk about him. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Walking down the road to Emmaus, the two disciples were talking about Jesus, and the Bible says Jesus drew near. They're talking about him, and he drew near. In the upper room, those same two disciples started talking about Jesus again, telling the other disciples, suddenly Jesus appeared. But Jesus will always be with you when you're telling others about Jesus. There's nothing that is more important to Christ than winning the lost. He said, go into the world, teach the gospel to all nations, Behold, I am with you. How is he with us? When we are out there teaching others about Christ, he is with you. Because you're doing his work. Malachi 3.16, I like this passage. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his son. If you read in the book of Ezekiel, who gets a mark on their forehead? This is a saving mark. You realize Revelation, you get the mark of the beast, bad mark. You get seal of God, forehead, good mark. Ezekiel 9 talks about a good mark, saving mark. Who gets it? The ones who sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in Israel. They're talking about the Lord. They're praying for repentance. They're praying for revival. Their minds are in heaven. God says, put a mark on those people. Their conversation, as Paul says, their conversation is in heaven. And those are the ones who have that mark. And then, of course, God is with those who do his work. I already mentioned Matthew 28. Go, make disciples. I am with you to the ends of the age. Acts 18.10. For I am with you. No one will attack you. I've got many people in this city. If we're out trying to reach the people in our community, God says, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. 2 Timothy 4, 17. But the Lord, Paul is speaking, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. He had to go and he had to stand before Nero and everyone had forsook him. But Paul said, the Lord was with me. Everybody had left him. Demas has forsaken me. But he said, the Lord was with me. And then another point, one of my final points here, we can be fearless if we know that God is with us. I noticed during the children's story, reading Psalm 23, Michael did a good job, even though I don't speak Portuguese. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why do we fear no evil? Because you're with me. 
if we just know that God is with us. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with your, my right hand. And you read in Isaiah 43, 1, Fear not, I have redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor will the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. Now, friends, I don't know if you're reading the headlines at all. It's been kind of depressing this year. I saw an interesting uh, mime on the Internet. You know how you do star ratings for different products? Some of them put 2020 and they gave it one star. But if you're looking at what's going on in the news, things that are happening in the world, freedoms that have been lost, and I understand you know, some of the, the rules about people congregating, but it's not, I think, a healthy trend for Christians not to gather together. You know, the Bible says the Sabbath is a holy convocation. In heaven, all flesh will come and gather together before me in heaven. And it's just not, a, I understand it, and, you know, I'm, I think that we need to respect the laws of the land. Also, things are happening religiously. I don't know if you caught it this week. Pope had a meeting with 27, a guardian group, 27 of the leaders of some of the most powerful corporations in America to talk about uh, changing the way business is done in the world, to preserve the environment, to help people socially, and I can just see that there is a shift happening. This year is like a place where you turn a chapter in world history. And we are very near, I think, the second coming of Jesus. And it's encouraging to me to remember that when Daniel was in the lion's den, it says that God was with him. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fiery furnace, what did Isaiah just promise? When you go through the fire, I'll be with you. And I think they claimed, you know, that was written before that happened to them. I think they claimed the promise of Isaiah that our God is able to deliver us even in the fire. That's what Isaiah said. And Jesus came to them in their fire. I think there are some fiery trials that are coming in the future. I think our faith is going to be tested. And I don't want you to be afraid. People say, oh, Doug, aren't you worried about the seven last plagues? That doesn't worry me at all. I'm worried about Doug. I'm worried about Doug separating himself from God. But if I'm with God, I have nothing to be afraid of. You know, the whole plan of salvation is, is designed to get us back to God. I want to go back to a verse I read earlier, but I'm going to read the whole thing. Ephesians 2.12, speaking of the loss, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, some listening, if you are wondering if God is with you, how do you get near? By the blood of Christ. By accepting the sacrifice of Jesus. That's why he came into the world, because he wants to be with us. In Revelation 21, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, is with men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Isn't that wonderful? You read in the Garden of Eden, man lost the garden, lost the tree of life, lost the presence of God. The last three chapters talk about man being restored to the garden, the tree of life, and the presence of God. In chapter 3, the dragon comes in. In Revelation, you read the, last, uh, the third from the last chapter, the dragon goes out. And he is destroyed. Revelation 22, verse 3. There'll be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. He's with us. His servants will serve him. They will see his face. Adam fled from the presence of the Lord. We will be restored to his presence. Revelation 22, 21. By the way, this is the last verse in the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, friends, I think that's such a beautiful truth. The last words, Jesus said, Jesus Christ, be with you. That's what he wants. He wants to be with us. He wants to be with us eternally. 
But you know, in order for that to happen, he needs to be with us now. He wants you to walk with him now. The word became flesh to dwell among us. Don't you want to have that experience? So when we read those simple words, God with us, that's really a summary of the whole plan of salvation. And we're going to sing about that in a closing hymn, and then we'll pray together. That's hymn 115, if you've got a hymnal, and some of you can find them. Those watching online, you may find that if you have one at home, or you can find it in the, uh, the app that has the hymnal. We're going to sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and then we'll have our closing prayer. And I think our singers will be coming out to lead us. Please stand. In 1791, John Wesley, that great revivalist and reformist founder of the Methodist Church, incredible Bible scholar, was dying. In his 80s, he was surrounded by friends and family, and his last words were, best of all, God is with us. And if we just know that, now there may be some who are here or watching, and uh, you want to have that experience of knowing that God is with us. You know, the promise is that we are made nigh by the blood of Christ, that in Christ the veil of separation is removed, that in Christ God took on human flesh, and in the same way that miracle took place of Jesus entering into Mary, Christ wants to enter into his church and be born in us. You invite him in, he wants it more than anything. And ask him to forgive you for your sins. Don't worry how you're going to live a new life tomorrow. You just ask him today and say, Lord, 
And you can pray that prayer right now. Come into my heart. Forgive my sins. This is a new year before us. Great time to have a new beginning in Jesus. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love for us that you would send your son, that you might abolish the separation, that we might be with you through eternity. I pray, Lord, you'll bless each person here that we might sense your presence now, that even through the trials of life that uh, the world is going through, that you've not forsaken your church, you've not forsaken your people, that uh, we have nothing to fear because you are with us. If there are some here who are running from you, Lord, I pray like the prodigal, they will turn around. They'll come to their senses. They'll arise and come to their father. We know that you will run out to meet them. And so please bless, Lord, as we submit to you, we draw near to you, we trust you will draw near to us. We want to be reconciled with you and have you living inside. Christ in us, the hope of glory, is our prayer, and we pray this in his name. Amen. God bless you. Be safe.